we will have uh, Dr. Deanna Weber, an assistant professor of music. She will present first, and then she will take over with presiding. And again, thank you for coming. Good afternoon. <laughs> I'm going to be speaking to you from back here so that, so that I can advance slides and show you some pictures as I'm speaking. I've got a little mic on. I'm a singer. I'm used to projecting photos. Um, thank you so much to Dr. Hill for inviting me to speak today. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the history of the music of the Albany Civil Rights Movement, uh, specifically about the Freedom Singers and their role in the music. If you were here this morning, you heard, heard uh, Charles Sherrod refer to the music as the backbone of this movement, that it was what strengthened the protesters and the marchers and all of the movement participants and kept them strong and kept them going. Uh, first, I'd like to tell you a little bit about how I came to know these amazing people who are still living pieces of history. I started researching this music back about six years ago and I discovered that there was much more than I personally knew about the music of Albany, Georgia and its history. I also discovered that my college students at Albany State were mainly unaware of this history, of what had happened at their institution and in their city. And many of my music students did not know this history of song, which is so rich and so important. Uh, so I decided to research it further. I learned that one of the things that made the Albany Movement community unique was the singing of all of its people. We heard earlier about how Albany was a unified movement community. We know that the civil rights movements in different cities were different. Albany was unique because you had the entire community meeting and working and marching and singing together young people, old people. This brought fundamental change not only to Southwest Georgia, but to the entire United States. The National Organization of Young People, which joined with the people, the citizens of Albany, in bringing the movement to life was the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. It was formed during the spring of 1960 when an estimated 70,000 young people across the South participated in some form of civil disobedience against segregation. Now we talk about young people, most of these were high school and college students from African American colleges and high schools. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC as it was called, arose from an effort to unite these different pockets of activity and it grew into a very well-run, influential organization. If you saw the movie Selma recently, you saw that there were two men from SNCC who were a little bit at odds with Martin Luther King, but they were very passionate in what they were doing and their organization had already uh, become very well run. In 1961, a young minister, we met him this morning from Petersburg, Virginia, named Charles Sherrod, arrived in Albany with two other SNCC workers, Cordell Regan, who went on to found the Freedom Singers, who you're going to hear later, and Charles Jones, who at that time was the chair of SNCC's Direct Action Committee. Now, they went into the community and met all kinds of people, but they enlisted the help of students, high school students and students at what was at that time Albany State College. It was not yet Albany State University as we know it. And these students participated in the movement against the wishes of their college administration. In fact, the students Bernice Johnson, who later became Bernice Regan, and Annette Jones, who was the reigning Miss Albany State College at that time, they led the first march of about 500 high school and college students from the campus to downtown Albany. Now we know that later on, Annette Jones was stripped of her title and these students, many of them, were actually expelled from school. Uh, a major project we're going to hear about later was undertaken in 2011 from the university to bring back those approximately 20 students who had been expelled from school and to give them honorary degrees. Now, of course, that was too little too late, but it was a good gesture and it was a, certainly a good thing to do on behalf of the university. And at that time, Annette Jones, the Miss ASC who had been stripped of her crown, was given her crown back which she so richly deserved. Also in 2011, Bernice Regan was our commencement speaker at Albany State University. 
and we were very glad to have her back, not only speaking, but singing for us as well. And she said that Albany was the first movement to be carried out by a unified black community since the Montgomery bus boycott and that the strength of the Albany movement was the singing of its young people. Now, it's important to remember that the SNCC Freedom Singers, although they traveled and they went and took this music around all over the country, they learned and joined with the people in the community. These were not people who came in and left. These were people, some of whom were already here, and taught and shared in the singing of the community. Now, the people of the Albany movement represented a unified community which crossed all kinds of lines. They crossed gender, class, age, socioeconomic status lines, young people marched along with old, poor farmers with well-to-do business owners, and a very great number of these were women and young people. Now, during the Jim Crow era, the Southern Black Church became a tool for activism and social reform. We heard about that from Reverend Boyd this morning and about how Shiloh housed the SNCC workers. Not only the music, but the leaders of the civil rights movement came from the church. The mass meetings were a cross between a political rally and a church service, with speakers and singing, not only by soloists and groups, but by everyone in attendance. You were not allowed to just be in the audience at these meetings. You had to participate and you had to sing. The first mass meeting of the Albany movement took place in the building right next to this one, the Old Mount Zion Baptist Church, on November 25, 1961. That was the Saturday after Thanksgiving that year. Bernice Regan, who was the program coordinator for the Albany movement, was in charge of the music for the mass meetings. Now, Penny Patch, we heard her name this morning. She was a white student from Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania, and she had come down to work with SNCC, and she was here in Albany. She was actually the first white woman to work in the Southern Civil Rights Movement. And she still, to this day, recalls the music that she heard. It was so powerful. Penny Patch says, the music was beautiful. Everyone sang, and the songs bound us together and made us strong. I always think of, and I remember, the song that I think of as Charles Sherrod's, one that is still so embedded in my heart that I have sung it to carry me through many difficult times over these past 30 years. And that song was Oh Freedom. The church was the birthplace of the freedom song as old traditions mixed with new sounds brought in by the young activists. Historian Taylor Branch, who wrote that landmark series on the civil rights movement called Parting the Waters, he wrote that the harmonies and intensities of naked voices became a trademark of the Albany movement. All of the sounds from the soaring gospel descants of the soprano soloist, and you're going to hear that soaring gospel descant later when you hear Rutha Harris sing at 4 o'clock. All of those sounds from those gospel descants to the thunderous hand clapping of the congregation were created by human flesh. Communal song, that means everybody singing together, is very powerful. The sound of many voices raised together in a common anthem. It's a physical, emotional, and spiritual motivator. You may have seen online a study that came out recently done by a Swedish team of neurologists. Uh, their head researcher was a man named Bjorn Vikoff. He led a study on the physical effects of communal, communal singing. What happens to people's bodies and minds when they're singing with a large group of people? And he determined something really interesting. He found out that once a group starts singing together, it doesn't take very long for their breathing and their heart rates to actually become synchronized. If you've sung in a choir or with a large group of people, you know that... Not only are you together artistically and mentally, but now you're actually together physically with your own heart rates. They fall into a shared rhythm guided by the tempo of the song. These freedom songs and this powerful a cappella singing inspired the folk singer and civil rights activist Julius Lester to write this passage. This is so important. Y'all listen to this. A song is to be sung. One's musical ability may be limited, but there are no limitations to one's spirit. A musical note is a guide, but it alone does not make a song. A song is to be sung. Some of the songs are to be shouted. <laughs> Others are to be sung quietly, 
lived with and allowed to grow within you and with you. But a song is to be sung. As contemporary scholars return to the spirituals for documentation of slave life, they also must look, look to the freedom songs for eyewitness accounts of the struggle for civil rights. Now, any of you who have ever read or done historical research know what a primary source is. A primary source is a first-person eyewitness account. It's not somebody writing about what they heard. It's someone who actually witnessed an event writing about what they actually saw. And that's what these songs were. Uh, some of these songs, such as We Shall Overcome, are rooted in earlier social movements. If you know about the history of that song, it was a labor movement song. It was a union song. Early unionists attempting to organize illiterate workers who couldn't read a song sheet used this kind of song sung and taught by rote to disseminate information and to convince those workers to voice their needs and speak up for their rights. In that same tradition, civil rights freedom songs were drawn from the music of the church and the music of the popular black culture of the time, with lyrics adapted to fit the events of the day and the sentiments of those who were working for the movement. Now, there were all kinds of songs, you know, everything wasn't serious. Some of the songs were humorous, like a song called Dogs about a black dog and a white dog who learned to get along and be friends. Some of them were about relationships. Remember, these are college students we're talking about in SNCC. So people were falling in love and dating. And there was a song called I Know We'll Meet Again about such a relationship where the couple had to separate. Other songs refer reference specific people in the movement, such as O. Pritchett, O. Kelly, which was about the police chief, Laurie Pritchett, and the mayor at that time, Asa Kelly. And that was a song that Rutha Harris sung while she was in jail. And they asked her to sing it every day because Laurie Pritchett liked to hear his name in that song. <laughs> and there is Pritchett at the top. We heard about him this morning. And also Mayor Kelly. Now, in 1962, the folk singer Pete Seeger, who had already visited Albany, and he'd heard the singing in the churches of these people, he uh, made his case to Jim Foreman, who at that time was the executive secretary of SNCC. And Pete Seeger asked if SNCC could find a group of young singers to go from the Deep South and travel north, travel out of this area into more urban areas, to help spread the news because people from outside the South didn't know what was going on down here. As we heard this morning, a lot of it was kept out of the press. A lot of it was kept silent. And he wanted, he thought people wouldn't always go to listen to a speech, but they'd go to hear a concert and they'd go to listen to singers. So this was a really great idea that he had. Uh, Foreman agreed to the idea and he asked Cordell Regan, who was in Albany at that time, to put together this group of the four original SNCC Freedom Singers. Now, Pete Seeger, of course, was one of those people responsible for teaching and popularizing We Shall Overcome, and he had experience in the labor movement himself, and he knew about the power of protest song. In November of 1962, the original Freedom Singers Quartet sang together for the first time at a Pete Seeger-sponsored benefit concert for SNCC to raise funds for them, held at the Morehouse College Gym in Atlanta. Now these are the original Freedom Singers pictured here. On the left is Charles Neblett, who sang bass, and then Bernice Johnson, who was the alto of the group, and Cordell Regan, who was the tenor and founder spokesperson of the group. And on the right is Rutha Harris, who is still with us and singing today with the Albany Civil Rights Institute Freedom Singers. Now at that time, all of these were students. All of them were working for SNCC. Um, everyone except Charles Neblett, the man on the left, had already been here in Albany. They'd been singing together in the churches and at these mass meetings. Um, Charles Neblett actually joined with them in Atlanta at that Morehouse uh, concert and started singing with them. Now he had come down from Southern Illinois and he had already led some movements up there. He had staged a successful protest there for fair on-campus housing for black students at Southern Illinois University because like so many places, although the law said you could not be segregated, they still were. 
So he was trying to right that wrong. And he had followed a group of SNCC workers to Mississippi, and that was where he realized, once he got down south, he realized that news of what was happening down here was not reaching the entire United States. So that was his motivation to join the Freedom Singers, to help spread the word. They toured all over the United States. They had many, many high points. They traveled in a beat-up station wagon. <laughs> it wasn't beat up. She says it was very nice and beautiful. <laughs> They served as musical ambassadors, not just for the Albany movement, but for the entire civil rights movement from the southern United States. They performed at Friends of SNCC benefits. These were groups that were formed in uh, communities up north mostly to raise funds for SNCC. And these people would pay for and sponsor and host the singers to come and join with them. And they would do benefit concerts. Someone wrote a newspaper review about the singers during this tour and called them a singing newspaper because they brought so much information and so many stories of what was happening down south. They performed at some great venues because of those connections that they got through the Friends of SNCC group. So these benefit concerts became a regular occurrence in places like New York and the jazz community. They found themselves on the national stage in Carnegie Hall because of those New York connections. They also sang at the Newport Folk Festival, which is the picture that you see here, along with Peter, Paul, and Mary, and Bob Dylan, and Joan Baez. But the high point of their tour was their appearance at the 1963 March on Washington, where Martin Luther King gave his I Have a Dream speech. Now, as Rutha Harris told me, their participation in the March on Washington almost did not happen at all. They were in California when they heard about the March on Washington. After they had sung at the Newport Folk Festival, they had gone to California. They were booked into a Los Angeles area folk club for six weeks where they performed at night, and this club was called the Ash Grove. Now, during the days, they spent their time going out in the, into the community and teaching and organizing for SNCC. It was during this six-week stay in California that they heard about the March on Washington. Now, although the leaders of SNCC told them to stay put because SNCC did not have the money to fly them all the way from California back to Washington, D.C. These singers, of course, did not want to miss such a historic occasion. Well, Harry Belafonte, who was, of course, one of those supporters of SNCC, offered to let them travel along with his entourage on his private plane to go to Washington, D.C. And, of course, they very happily accepted and flew with Harry Belafonte to Washington, D.C. They arrived just in time to participate in the end of the march, just as the pre-concert was ending. Now, the Freedom Singers have left a powerful legacy of activism through music. Cordell Regan passed away in 1996. There he is with Bernice at the age of 53. He was 53 when he passed. Um, he became a leader in the civil rights movement in 1959 at the age of 16. That just makes me stop in my tracks for a minute because I have a 17-year-old son, and I know how high schoolers are now, and it's incredible to me that someone of that age went out and did what he did. He went on to organize, of course, the original SNCC Freedom Singers, and he was very cognizant and very knowledgeable about the power of music. As he said, the music doesn't change governments, but we can change people, individual people. The people can then go out and change the governments. Charles Neblett lives in Kentucky where he formed the African American Research Center in Russellville, Kentucky. He travels the country still speaking about civil rights and singing. He also has remastered the original recordings of the Freedom Singers. And his focus is the importance of sustaining a respect for that history in the education of the newest generation. Dr. Bernice Johnson Reagan, I'm sure you've all heard of her. She became a founding member of the Atlanta-based Harambe Singers in 1966. In 1973, she formed the group we're going to hear in our municipal auditorium here Tuesday night, Sweet Honey in the Rock which she led until her retirement from that group in 2004. She currently resides in Washington, D.C., but she travels all over the country. 
She's a curator emeritus at the Smithsonian, and she travels internationally as a speaker and a performer. And as I told you earlier, she was our commencement speaker at Albany State University in December of 2011, where she too received her honorary degree after being expelled from school. Rutha Harris lives right here in Albany. She continued her work as an activist after the 1963 Freedom Singers Tour. She served as an organizing singer for Martin Luther King's group, the group that he was the first president of, which was the, which was the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Uh, after she finished her music degree at Albany State, she taught for 30 years at her alma mater, Monroe High School in Albany, Georgia. And of course, she's now the leader of the Albany Civil Rights Institute Freedom Singers. She participates frequently in commemorative events. Uh, that one of those happened this past year. I was pleased and honored mm -hmm. along with Dr. Hill with support from T. Marshall Jones, Lee Formwalt, Neota Tucker, and others to nominate this group for the 2014 Georgia Governor's Award for the Arts and Humanities. And I'm very proud to tell you that they won that award. So we are proud of our hometown singers. Ruth Harris also is keeping the song going by teaching this music to the next generation. A younger audience is now learning these songs and they're learning this history. Um, Ms. Harris recently came to, that's two students from my music appreciation class at Albany State University there. Uh, she came to our class this past fall and sang, but of course, you know, she not only performed, she had the students sing as well. So she taught the songs to them, divided my class up into two halves, and they got a little competitive with each other to see who could do the best. Um, and I want to tell you an interesting story about that day. This young lady on the right, down in the front, her name is Janelle. And as we were coming into the class that day, as the students were coming into class, I, have, I always have music playing when they come into their class sessions. And that day I had the Freedom Singers music playing. And this young lady came in and she kind of slumped down in her seat. She was in the front row close to me. She says, Dr. Weber, why do we have to listen to this slave music? And I said, well, you're going to learn something today. You're going to learn some history. And I have someone here who's going to talk to you. And she didn't look too enthused. But then Ruth Harris came in and did her presentation. And then at the end of it, the same young lady came up to me and she said, I want to tell you something. She said, I grew up in Atlanta and every single year as a child, I was bused to the King Center. Every single year I saw the film. Every single year during Black History Month, I heard about Martin Luther King. And she said it just got to be the same thing over and over. But she said, let me tell you that today, to hear from somebody who was actually there and somebody who was my age, she said, I have a whole new appreciation for this. So much so that she wanted to make sure that she got her picture taken with Miss Rutha. <laughs> And I just have recently heard about a project that is being undertaken here with a grant from the uh, Georgia Council for the Arts and Humanities to start a project to actually go out into the schools and teach the freedom songs to a younger generation so that we might have a group of middle and high school students who are singers and bring up a whole new group of freedom singers. So I think that's a fantastic idea. Charles Sherrod, one of the first SNCC workers to come to Albany, said, if we're unconscious of where we've been and what we've done, then we will make the same mistakes again. To know history is to know the past, and the good things out of the past will make you better. It is clear that the repertory of freedom songs can no longer be considered a style of music only associated with Black History Month and Martin Luther King. This is the music of all of our history. This is the music of American history. The continuing relevance of this body of song was brought to light at the 2010 White House Celebration of Civil Rights Music. The three remaining freedom singers, accompanied by Bernice Regan's daughter, Toshi Regan, on guitar, performed Ain't Gonna Let Nobody Turn Me Around, the anthem of the civil rights movement. For President Obama, the first family, and a packed house of dignitaries from the civil rights era, and icons from the world of music. In 1962, in my hometown, we were engaged in a very intense struggle against racial segregation. And there were mass jailings. At one point, a federal judge issued an injunction with names on it of the people they thought were the leaders of the movement. 
Reverend Samuel Wells was in Shiloh Baptist Church that night. And he said, I'm not going to let no injunction turn me round. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me round. Turn me round. Turn me round. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me round. I know this is a show, but uh, you have to actually sing this song. You can never tell when you might need it. <laughs> Ain't gonna let nobody Albany Civil Rights Institute in the original wooden sanctuary of the old Mount Zion Baptist Church, the very place where the music of the Albany movement began, the old songs ring out again. The newest group of freedom singers, led by one of the originals, Ms. Ruth Mae Harris, march into the sanctuary with 1960s protest signs in hand. Through song and story, they share history with those who have gathered there. The audience on a given day might be made up of school groups, family reunions, local supporters, and visitors passing through town. For a moment, all those who gather are transported to remember the events which took place in the very pews in which they now sit. And just as during the movement, the audience is not permitted to only passively observe, they are called to participate. At the end of every concert, everyone is asked to stand cross their right arm over their left, hold hands with those on either side of them, and join in singing, We Shall Overcome. Once again, the song unites all of them as they remember what it meant to sing for freedom. Thank you. <laughs> Where was I? I was in diapers in Florida. <laughs> I was about two. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. 